Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The role of intelligence agencies is a vexed one in any democracy. We do need secrets and spies. The problem is when we get secrets, spies and lies. Just last week, Moazem Beg, a man who'd already been unjustly incarcerated in Guantanamo Bay, walked from Belmarsh Prison, yet again an innocent man, though having been held for months on serious terrorist charges, which the state then abandoned without explanation. These things have been happening again and again. Politicians have to take the rep, but they're usually acting on the advice of our spies. So, who are our spies? Are they James Bonds? Or Austin Powers. <laughs> our first guest was one of our spies in MI5. She can't tell us everything she did or else she'd have to kill us. But she still might be helpful. And she comes in peace on board the Sputnik. She's Annie Mashon. Annie, let me start, if I may, with the Mozambique uh, story. A man unjustly incarcerated in Guantanamo Bay and now in our own uh, sort of mini Guantanamo Bay in Belmarsh the state abandoning the case, even though it would have been a case warranting 15 years of imprisonment yes. if he'd been found guilty, without a word of explanation. Can you shed any light? I know you're not, uh, of course, operational, uh, but you do know how these agencies work. What might have happened? I th it was, for me, it seems that it was probably some sort of let's try and avoid, avoid embarrassing court cases, uh, which would bring in the security angle and the political angle. So you have a situation where he would have claimed, quite rightly, moral equivalence with what our spies and our armies get up to, our military gets up to, in uh, illegal invasions, illegal occupations and all that sort of thing. The justification that if you are an oppressed people or an occupied people, you have a right, in fact, even a social duty, to push back against those occupiers is a very well-recognised one, a very strong historic um, trend. And I think that's all he would be able to argue, but that would have been effective. Well, yeah, I don't agree with what he says he did do, uh, but he's right when he says mm. what he did do yeah. was exactly what the British government was itself doing and encouraging, namely uh, strengthening the opposition including armed opposition, uh, fighting in Syria. Yes, and they have a long and ignoble history of doing this right across the Middle East, right across the world. And every time they do it, it seems to go wrong. And every time they do it, they create more blowback. We have a long history now of huge errors and blunders yeah. that almost always fail, uh, almost always have the opposite effect, uh, as was claimed, for them when they were embarked upon. Who should we blame for that? Is it the agencies? Is it their political masters who are setting them the wrong tasks? Uh, or is it uh, a systemic thing? Does it, does it flow from secrecy? Too much secrecy. It is systemic. It does come from too much secrecy. And the fact that they can get away with whatever they want to get away with. So. The one, you know, there is a long list of scandals, we know that, but those are only the ones that have come out. There are many, many other mistakes and cock-ups and things like that that go on, which they can then lie to, to their political masters, and they do it time and time again. And, in fact, most of the former heads of the intelligence agencies and former top cops have said quite publicly they blench because they didn't tell the whole truth to the Intelligence and Security Committee in Parliament, or they lied. In fact, they have been caught out lying, MI5, uh, when they said originally they were not involved in torture. And then the last boss but one, I think, had to admit he had lied. It was a, you know, they had been involved in torture, and that's why they've been having to pay out compensation to the torture victims of the British state. But I do think it is systemic as well. We have a situation, a very sort of British model, where our intelligence agencies have evolved over 100 years, and they've never been properly controlled, they've never been properly overseen. In fact, they didn't officially exist until 1989. Mm. Um, so they have got very used to working with complete secrecy. And anyone inside who rocks the boat and asks ethical questions or says, should we really be doing this, is told to just shut up and not follow orders. So the ones who are the yes-men tend to progress and get to the top positions. And you get this sort of very um, closed groupthink. Um, and I think this also contributes to the moral slide, the moral degeneracy that we see, where MI5, for example, can get reinvolved in torture when it had avoided it during the 1990s. Just one other aspect around this. I think MI5 is a bit of a historic throwback. I'm not quite sure what its role is in mm, a modern democracy. Because we have a situation, we have the, the listening post, the government communications headquarters in Cheltenham, allied to the NSA. Um, we have MI6, which is like the CIA, our foreign intelligence gathering organisation. And what's our equivalent for the FBI, for example? Mm, right. It's the National Crime Agency. 
with police powers to arrest and carry out executive action. MI5 does not have that. MI5 seems to be duplicating what the National Crime Agency does, but with fewer powers and greater secrecy. And, and this more is money, Very much so, yes, mm. yeah. So what is its role in a modern democracy? I mean, to, to spend so much time just hoovering up all our information and watching the population, it's beginning to remind me, remind me much more of the Stasi in East Germany. My uh, active involvement in these matters goes back uh, to the early 1980s. I became friends with the late Lord Wilson as Harold Wilson, four times the Prime Minister of Britain. I sat many times in his rather gloomy flat in Victoria and he regaled me with the destabilisation of him as a suspected communist uh, by <laughs> British uh, intelligence. Nothing could be further from the truth, of course, uh, by uh, British intelligence. Then I was swiftly into the miners' strike mm. uh, in which I was deeply involved virtually every single day of the whole year. Uh, of strike and the penetration of that strike by British intelligence, MI5. Uh, and of course, as a prominent opponent of the Iraq war, uh, here we were back again with the intelligence services, uh, either at the behest of the political leadership or just to please them, feeding false information, fake information into the policy making uh, process. Mm. So I'm wondering if the time hasn't come, and you alluded to it there in your previous answer, to actually abolish MI5. Uh, that'll probably get me uh, <laughs> some uh, difficulties uh, later on when this is broadcast. But really, I'm wondering what is their role? Yeah. And, uh, and an agency with so many mistakes mm. uh, to its discredit, surely at one point or other forfeits the right to continue to receive vast sums of public money. Well, not only receive vast sums of public money, but also abuse our basic mm. freedoms throughout this country. Mm. Um, it's a very good question. I can't see what they bring to the intelligence table, which is unique. Um, in the old days, of course, they started out as a counter-espionage agency, particularly in the so against the Soviet Union, the Cold War. And as a sort of uh, knock-on effect of that, they then really built up this vast counter-subversion section, which investigated UK citizens purely for their political beliefs. And this, this covered hundreds of thousands, up to a million UK citizens for their involvement mainly in left-wing politics. And then the Cold War ended. What were they to do? Suddenly it looked like they'd lost a great mm. chunk Richard, of their work, yeah. yeah. So this is when there was some very clever manoeuvring behind the scenes, where the um, head of the time, Dane Stella Remington, seized control of the investigation of the provisional IRA and other Northern Ireland terrorist groups in the UK mainland, and they took it from the Metropolitan Police, which caused huge eruptions behind the scenes, by the way, because all these different agencies are competing for the same powers and resources. Mm. So we have a situation where... Um, a counter-espionage intelligence agency used to working against very slow-moving targets, you know, going and bugging the Soviet embassy or following a few the political actors. I know, that sort yeah. of thing. Suddenly, they were put in charge of these really fast-paced terrorist investigations, which in those days, you had to gather the information, gather the intelligence, and, of course, crucially, gather the evidence so that if you could, you could put a terrorist suspect on trial in front of a jury of their peers. Now, we've lost that. I mean, if we have a terrorist suspect, we just bang them out without due process, like Mozambique. But in those days, that was the, the key point. Now, MI5 officers had no training in evidence gathering. They had no training in that whole due process. And I think that also led to a number of massive mistakes um, that I saw along with David Shaler back in the 1990s. Of course, the crucial difference between the police and MI5 is that, obviously not perfectly, but the police are accountable. Mm. Uh, they can be held to account for mistakes that they make. MI5 cannot. Uh, the money that's voted to them uh, is not uh, questionable in the House. Their mistakes are not uh, questionable. Ministers say mm -hmm. we never mm -hmm. comment on, on intelligence uh, matters. At least you can have the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police in front of a select committee. You can grill him. Parliamentary questions can be asked of the Home Secretary about him, uh, or her, as uh, mm. might uh, soon be the, the case. That's a key point, isn't it? And you're a transparency uh, campaigner. It's, that's one of the key reasons why we must raise this question. Absolutely. Our intelligence agencies are the least accountable and most legally protected of any Western country, although it looks like America is rapidly beginning to catch up on that front. 
um, they're hedged around by a whole series of laws to protect them against disclosure and to protect them from accountability. So, in 1994, we had the Intelligence Services Act put in place to govern uh, MI6 and GCHQ, which crucially put into Parliament as well the Intelligence and Security Committee in Parliament, which is actually appointed by, or for a long time was, only appointed by the Prime Minister, and its findings were vetted by the Prime Minister, and it was only there to look at policy, finance and administration. Mm -hmm. It had no powers whatsoever to investigate um, allegations of misconduct. Mm. Now, this has been beefed up in the last year. Yeah, but it's still filled with trustees. It's filled with placemen, and it's chaired by Sir Malcolm Rifkind, um, who, as soon as the whole Snowden um, stuff started coming out, especially about GCHQ and how they're running rampant um, against the privacy of 500 million Europeans, then Sir Malcolm Rifkind says, oh, I've asked them, and they say they're operating within the law. It's all hunky-dory, don't worry, I know what's going on. And yet, I know from the inside, and it was part of the whistleblowing I did with David Shaler in the 1990s, quite how easily they can lie to the Intelligence and Security Committee, how they can lie to their political master, the Foreign Secretary, and they do repeatedly. It is a, an extraordinary situation, uh, and it's not that we're without perils. Uh, there, there are terrorists, mm. there are plots, uh, there are dangerous people uh, operating in our country. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that, because we're liberals, as a matter of fact, I'm not a liberal, <laughs> uh, that we are making this critique. It's not just about the ethics, it's about the efficiency yes. and the competence of these agencies. Yes, <clears throat> and because they are so secret, they can get away with being incompetent and by making mistakes because they can lie about those mistakes, so they don't learn the lessons. So they continue to make those mistakes and they continue to put our safety at risk. Now, all this war on terror stuff, of course, started with 9-11 and it started with the American hysterical over-response globally and brutally to this terrorist threat, this evil-tude. Um, and yet, of course, in the UK, we have far more experience of a realistic threat on a daily basis from Irish terrorism, for example. And I remember all the same debates about civil liberties and things going on in the 1980s. And at that point, we did not give away all our basic freedoms. We did not give all these new powers and new resources to create this massive spy infrastructure. What we did was targeted, often human-led, proper intelligence investigations to gather evidence and then put these people on trial if necessary. You don't just have this dragnet surveillance of everybody and kill all notions of privacy and democracy by so doing. Uh, so I think you need to, to get that balance. We've gone so far out, um, mm. so far into the pocket of America and their over-indulgence and over-reliance on tech as well that suddenly we're living in this sort of endemic surveillance state. Well, almost police state, if you want to believe... Poli um, well, Theresa May, uh, Theresa May well yes. have announced uh, an impending police state uh, in her I speech saw. in Birmingham I saw at that. the uh, Tory party <laughs> conference. Annie Marshall, thanks. That's been fascinating. We must continue it another time. Coming up after the break on the 47th anniversary of the murder of the man of the century, Rob Miller on Che Guevara. You don't want to miss it. Welcome back to Sputnik. He was not Cuban, but he risked his life many times in the cause of their liberation. He was not African, but he fought alongside the greatest of all African leaders, Patrice Lumumba, in the Congo. He was neither Asian, but he fought US imperialism in Vietnam. And he was not Bolivian, but he gave the last of his life's blood, making revolution against fascism there. He was the most inspiring man of the century, and in my view, he still is. Joining us now to discuss Commandante Che Guevara on the anniversary of his murder by US imperialism is Cuba Solidarity Campaign Director Rob Miller. But first, Gayatri, dressed for the part, took the microphone to central London to hear the voice of the people. I'm sorry, I don't know who he is. You don't know? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right. uh, I don't know. Thank you, man. I can't say I know much about him, unfortunately. Che Guevara? No. I know nothing about him, to be honest. I know of him. You know I know about nothing him? about him, yeah. I just know he's somehow iconic and that everybody talks by him. You know, he stands for so many good things, although he's a romantic figure, I suppose. Obviously, he was against capitalism, so if I'm completely honest, I'm not especially impressed by people who wear Che Guevara T-shirts because I think they're just buying into capitalism, which is exactly what he's against. A friend of mine went to Cuba two years ago and she brought me a cigar with his face uh, on, on, on the case of, of the cigar. But I don't smoke, so I keep it as a, you know, as a souvenir. I think he was really a 
an hero for a lot of people and an example for a lot of people. Unlike many revolutionaries who pursued power and nothing else, I think Che Guevara was very genuine. Que viva la revolucion. Yes. Si. Rob Miller mixed uh, uh, Vox Pops there. A surprising number of people didn't know anything about him, but those who did kind of got it right. Uh, how do you account for this global phenomenon, uh, this picture, the famous picture, which you were, I know, deeply involved in uh, getting justice uh, for the photographer on? This picture must have been reproduced more than any picture of any person in history. How do you account for it all? Well, I think Che was a beautiful man. He was incredibly handsome. That image really sells him as that man, a man deep in thought, but with a purpose. And I personally think it's more than the image. It's about his beliefs, and it's about what he achieved as a person. And I think people around the world know about Che through his image, but then when they find out about him, he actually signifies something about change and about possibilities for the future. Che believed in a better world, as we know, a better world is possible, and Che believed in it, wrote about it, and fought for it, and ultimately died for it. He has become a symbol of change, a symbol of revolution, an anti-imperialist symbol, and that's where you see Che's figure most, in the anti-Vietnam wars, in Chile, across Latin America, in the Middle East, where people are actually trying to uh, persevere and work for their own national identities, for their own progress for their peoples, normally against an imperialist aggression. That's where you see Che's uh, figure, Che's image coming out. He stands there in front of everybody as a symbol of an anti-imperialist struggle, and one that can be won. The famous picture uh, has a big story attached to it. Tell us it. Absolutely. I mean, we, we in, uh, after, in 1997, after, on the 30th anniversary of the death of Che Guevara, uh, we organised a very big exhibition about Che and we, we contacted all the photographers, Salas, Perfecto Romero, Alberto Corda, to get images of Che. And uh, Alberto Corda gave us some wonderful images, some of the first images that were seen over here of Che with his daughter Aleda as a baby, uh, Che playing golf with Fidel uh, in, in Havana. Some of those images, which are now iconic, were shown at this exhibition for the first time. A couple of years later, Smirnoff, the vodka, company decided to use the image to advertise vodka and billboards went up across Britain. The, Where image. the image of Che was there, revolutions, revolutionary spirit mm. advertising vodka. Now, Che was, was teetotal. He was asthmatic. And we were in touch with Cord and we said, how come you're allowing your image to be used for this Smirnoff advert? He was outraged. But, of course, his image had been used across the world for a multifarious uh, number of advertising opportunities. So we said, would you like us to explore the possibilities? And we did. And the case went to all the way up through the High Court. In fact, we didn't sue Smirnoff, but we, we, we sued Low Lintas, the advertising agency. We sued Rex Features, the photographic agency that had provided the, the case. And we went all the way to the High Court and won a huge settlement and the, 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 the proceeds from the settlement were actually donated to a children's hospital in Havana for asthma uh, patients, for children with asthma. But the case revolved around whether Corder had been an employee of the newspaper Revolution when he took the original photo, or whether he owned the actual uh, copyright because he took the photo, it was his negative, Revolution didn't exist anymore. And we uh, clarified the situation that the photograph was owned by him and could not be abused by anybody across the globe. Sadly, it still is in many places, and to police these images is very difficult. But it was the first time that he received anything for that photograph. And in a way, it's kind but of... he donated this? On that, so he never took on that the particular personal case. Benefits. No, he didn't take it for personal benefit. The money was donated to a children's hospital in, in Havana. Since then, the family and the estate try and police the use of the image, and particularly the abuse of the image. How important in Cuba is the legacy of Che Guevara. He wasn't Cuban. He left the uh, Cubans a uh, long time ago, in the mid-1960s. Uh, is he still remembered there, still revered there? Che crops up at every point in, in the Cuban psyche, in the Cuban history. You don't see Che everywhere. 
It's not, uh, you know, he's, he's not uh, there in front of you all the time, but it crops up. You know, his body was uh, returned to Cuba in, in 97, where it's now in the museum in Santa Clara, where he won his most famous battle against the, the troops of Batista at the time of the revolution. And he's referred to by children uh, in the streets, by uh, people working, as a model of how we should strive as a nation to be. We should be like Che. And that's something that I think is terribly important for the Cuban people to know that Che is this symbol and that they can be like Che in terms of their internationalism and their love for humanity, which for us, we believe very much the Cuban mm. revolution is all about. He's a good example of how you can win even whilst losing. Uh, he lost his life in Bolivia. The putative revolution that he was trying to spark in Bolivia failed. But now we have uh, one of the best and most progressive governments in the world in power uh, in Bolivia. Uh, and uh, the United States, by murdering him, uh, actually made a very grave mistake. They even took pictures of the dead Che, but quickly realized they must suppress them because the Christ-like figure of Che lying there dead would have been even more potent, mm -hmm. actually, than Corda's uh, pictures. Um, what happened to, uh, if you know, uh, the people who took the decisions and who fired the uh, bullets into Che Guevara? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting story, the specific story. I mean, Che was murdered, and he was murdered by the CIA. What is fascinating, and it came out a few years ago, uh, the guy who shot Che Guevara was a, was a Bolivian sergeant called Mario Turan, and he was the one who was ordered by, by the Bolivians, by the CIA, to kill Che. And uh, in 2000, he cropped up, I think it was 2000, possibly, no, 2007, I think. He cropped up because the Cubans were running their international missions, and one of their international missions was Operacion Milagro, which is the restoration of sight for people with cataracts. And they had Cuban doctors right up in the hills of Bolivia. A little old guy comes in, virtually blind from his cataracts, and he's treated by the Cubans, as they treat everyone free of charge in the Operation Milagro, which is a joint enterprise with, with the Venezuelans and uh, the Ecuadorians and the Bolivians. A few months later, Mario, uh, the son of the guy, writes a letter thanking these doctors. It turns out that he's the son of Mario Turan, the guy that killed Che Guevara, and the guy who had the treatment was Mario Turan. And you talk about turning Che into victory, because, of course, the Cuban newspapers published the fact that there you are, Cuban doctors, free of charge, no bitterness whatsoever, actually restored the sight of the very man who had been the person who'd shot the bullets that killed Che Guevara. So you have Venezuela, you have Bolivia, you have Cuba, you have the United States. And it also shows the sort of integration of the, of the whole Bolivarian dream, the dream that Che Guevara followed for a... Personified, Personified yeah. it for, for Latin America United. And there it was in the hills, and that they gave generously. There was no bitterness about this fact. And the Cuban government saw that as another example. Mm of what we as a nation can do for people around the world, no matter who they are. We're about people, not about old battles or anything like that. Cuba Solidarity Campaign, by far and away the best solidarity campaign in Britain that I've ever worked with. How do people help you? How can they get involved? Well, specifically on this question, uh, 29th of November, and I'm, I know you're coming along, we've got a big conference in London, the Latin America Conference, and the daughter of Che Guevara, Aleida, his oldest daughter, Aleida Guevara, will be in London at that conference, talking about the legacy of Che, but also about the blockade against Cuba, about the struggle for freedom for the Cuban Five, the Miami Five, yeah. who are locked up in US jails. Yeah. So that would be a wonderful opportunity for people who are particularly interested in Che. But obviously, contact us at any time. We're the Cuba Solidarity Campaign on the web. You can get us by looking on online and getting in touch. We're a membership organisation. And we campaign primarily against the blockade, for better relations between Britain, Europe and Cuba, and obviously for the question of sovereignty for Cuba, free from outside aggression, and particularly from the United States. Comandante Che Guevara, presente. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? On the subject of spies, Joker warns us that Taxi drivers are all spies, so never ever actually tell them where you really want to go. They'll screw them up for sure. <laughs> and Alpha Renegade tells us that actually Britain's spy agencies are neither James Bond nor Austin Power, 
It's more Johnny English. On Che Guevara, Comandante Che Guevara, Mevosh Amin says that I had it on my wall in Paris when I was a student there, the poster boy for a less materialistic generation. And Hamid Sharokni says it's an image of a courageous visionary who indeed was the most complete human being of our age. I think there's no uh, doubt about that. And I think neither is there a doubt that 100 years from now, 200 years from now, we'll this image will still be uh, rallying and inspiring people. He really was the man of the 20th century for me. So, well, that's all that we have for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can keep in touch with us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik and on Facebook you can like us on Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. Thank <laughs> you.